Well, welcome all. Thank you very much for uh, your attendance at this uh, May meeting of the LEPC. Uh, we're fortunate today that we have uh, Rachel Fleck with us. She's the local coordinator for MEMA Region 2. Yes. And uh, Rachel's been around for a bit. Um, she is very, very resourceful and helps with a lot of educational um, components uh, for, the, for the fire chiefs, for other local uh, agencies that might have to have the interaction with uh, MEMA, um, the MAC, which has stood up, uh, you know, during major uh, storms and events. And Rachel, fortunately, is, is in the MAC, helping out and brings the resources of MEMA to bear and uh, really does help us on a local level. So it's, uh, it, it's important to have a great partnership, not just with MEMA, but with our coordinator, who uh, we know. So it's, it's, it's good when we stand up our EOC, we actually have some personal connection uh, with some that are, in the, uh, that are at the MAC, and we can, you know, uh, they understand, you know, our community, and, and you know, we can talk to them and, and get some clear answers, and I think, from being involved in the EOC and, and Craig and, and Boyd and, and Mel from, from his previous pre-retirement years, um, you know, know knows how important that is to trying to, to to be able to coordinate some of the response or to ask for assistance on, you know, <coughs> such as you know whether it's NSTAR or, or Eversource or National Grid or any other supplies and things like that. So the coordinating, the planning, the planning is all very instrumental for us here on, on a local level. Um, and I've attended a few classes with uh, with Rachel, and she does a great presentation, and uh, she's going to provide that today for us. Uh, Kim specifically asked her to kind of go over the roles of me, you know, resources for emergency preparedness for the managers, public safety partners, disaster preparedness for the stakeholders, which is all of us. And it, it's it, it's being Chris. Campbell, who's our uh, communications administrator, has been new with us, uh, and he's been embedded with us in the last few storms, and we've raised the level of professionals that are sitting in here, and again, it's, it's, it's all due to everybody's interest and desire to, to you know, to, to, to get us through the storm safely and to help the community. So, with that being all set, I'll invite Rachel up, and uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been with MEMA for um, 11 years, and Falmouth, I can say, um, has always been a pleasure to work with, a lot of hard work with, um, from Kim and the Chief. Um, I have intimate knowledge of your town, working Blizzard Nemo um, for three days in the shelter there, so very familiar with a lot of your staff um, and the volunteers, and so um, thank you for having me up tonight. Um, so today I'm going to give you an overview, a little background about MEMA and what we do, and then I'm going to close it out with actually talking about how, our role with this particular LEPC and how we integrate together with the locals. Um, so as I go along, feel free to just ask questions as we go along. Um, and any any history buffs in the room? Mel, oh yeah. Oh, oh great. All right, you want to come on up and teach? Oh no. <laughs> a little history about where we can where we come from. Um, so in the late 1940s and 1949, um, the Soviet Union had a very successful nuclear bomb test that then concerned the United States. Um, China claimed to be a communist nation. And with all of that in the background, there was some really strong concern about a nuclear attack in um, America. And so out of that came the Federal Civil Defense Act of 1950, and at this time, it was mandated that each state create a civil defense agency. So you'll see that uh, emblem up there on the right. If you see that, that's the old emblem for emergency management. But at the time when it first started, it was known as Civil Defense Agency, CDA. Um, so Massachusetts uh, created a civil defense agency um, also in 1950. And as part of this, um, in, in a few years later, actually I'll talk about um, Kennedy mandated that towns and uh, sorry that states actually create um, bunkers and so we have a few photos of our bunker but out of the the federal civil defense act of 1950 
um, training was required um, for, for public educators, for the schools. You'll see pictures here of Bert the Turtle. Um, and they started doing all these um, training efforts behind the community and training them around sheltering in place. Um, and out of that also came um, fallout shelters. So I have to say, in all my years working recently, was the most we've gotten questions about fallout shelters with mm -hmm. everything going on with Russia and Ukraine. We've actually had calls um, from community members asking, do you still have fallout shelters? Do they still exist? Um, because initially, uh, MEMA was in charge of building the standards for what, what are the building codes and the standards behind fallout shelters. So no, they still, they do not exist um, anymore. There's no building codes for them, but um, I never thought I'd get asked that question. And recently, we've gotten some, some calls from the public about that. Um, so um, our bunker, if anyone's ever been up to Framingham Route 9, that's a lovely drive. <laughs> um, we, uh, uh, Kennedy, as I stated, actually mandated that um, all states create a bunker, an underground facility that could withstand a nuclear attack. And so they determined Framingham was a great spot for that because it's far enough away from Boston, assuming that Boston would be the target. Um, and it's an underground facility of um, almost like a maze um, that they created that it would be able to withstand a nuclear attack. It's meant to house 300 government employees it was built with a uh, morgue and a birthing center. So with the expectation that one person would die and one person would be born um, for those months where people would have to seek shelter. Um, and our claim to fame was that on the day that Kennedy was assassinated um, was the day that um, he signed a letter saying he could not come to the opening of the bunker. Um, so that's a little bit of our claim to fame there. Um, the, again, to withstand that nuclear force, they built a, there's a blast door that is still on site. Um, it's not closed, it just remains open, but it's, um, eight, as you can see here, 82 inches high, um, what is it, nine inches thick, I think, and it weighs almost 6,000 pounds. Um, and this is what it looks like. So when I first went to my interview at Mima, I was like, where's the door? So <laughs> it's just that little, it's just that little hut. And then from there, you just descend into the darkness. So there's no windows down there, and everyone, a um, little sad, there's no, there's no vitamin D down there for folks. But um, uh, it is an interesting facility if anyone ever wants a tour. <clears throat> so that was uh, the 1960s, but emergency management really didn't get um, going in Massachusetts, really, because of the famous blizzard of 1978. Obviously, um, for those that were around, you, you know that was a pretty big storm for us. You know, hurricane-forced winds. Here you can see it was four successive high tides. Um, the most, the biggest evacuation Massachusetts has ever seen with 10,000 people evacuated from the coastline. 17,000 people sought shelter. Um, I hear they got stuck in Boston at one of the games um, and they were stuck there for several days. Um, so out of that, um, their response was, was a little um, scattered and so it kind of, um, you know, anytime there's a major disaster, you'll see usually law and regulation will come after because something goes wrong, right? So that's what is about to happen. But here's some interesting photos. 14 people died on Route 128 because of carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, they were in their cars, uh, unable to get rescued um, quickly enough. And then, of course, Situate, always the winner. When it comes to damage, that's um, Situate buried almost up to the top for the car. So out of that, um, came executive order, we call it EO 144 from the governor, and it actually mandated um, that uh, MEMA, the Civil Defense Agency, would be in charge of handling all um, disasters within Massachusetts. And it mandated that actually um, um, state partners have to train and coordinate with us. So when we do activate and we ask DOT to come, we ask state police to come, we're asking, but it's really mandatory when we ask them to come, they come and they activate and they work with us in the bunker. Um, this is our official mission, again, ensuring that the state is prepared to withstand um, and respond and recover from all disasters. And we do that through partnerships, um, through acquiring vendor contracts, uh, and by working with the locals to ensure that they're prepared as well. And of course, it's an all hazards approach. It's not just nuclear preparedness anymore. Now it's, um, you know, unfortunately terrorist attacks and blizzards and hurricanes and, and the like. And now cybersecurity. 
So we fall under um, the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, so under the same bucket as State Police, um, the, the Guard, Department of Fire Services. So that's where we fall under. And then we're organized. We really have um, five major units. So we have our planning and our nuclear preparedness. We, um, we used to be a part of three nuclear power plants. Um, one was in Vermont Yankee, but we were within that 10 mile radius for, that's required for emergency planning. Then we have Seabrook, which is in New Hampshire, and then obviously Plymouth. So two out of those three have been shut down which um, to us makes a big difference because they were giving us money. So we lost millions of dollars once they closed down. So, you know, the state has had to pick up a little bit of the funding. The state's typically only um, given us 25% of our budget, and then we get the rest of our budget from um, the nuclear plants and from the federal government. So that was um, a little bit of a hit when they shut down. Uh, we have our planning unit. They, um, they manage all the state plans, so all of you love and I've heard about the Cape Cod traffic plan. That would be one such plan that the planning unit is in charge of. Um, it would be, um, we were talking about a family reunification plan if we have an active shooter event. Um, that's one of the plans, ethanol plans. Um, then we have our comprehensive emergency management plan for the state. Um, that's also part of that. But there's about 50 plans that that unit is in charge of. Um, and we still do have our nuclear preparedness unit. Now they're primarily focused on Seabrook, of course. Um, training and exercise. Anyone familiar with ICS here, Incident Command System? So MEMA um, uh, holds those courses across the Commonwealth um, for our public safety officials. Um, we're, the, um, we're considered the, the lead trainer for that in Massachusetts by the federal government. So we put on those courses for our partners as well as some others. Um, Response and field services, this is where I fall under as a regional office. Um, it's my, well, I should get into a little bit about what I do specifically. But underneath that, as well as our operations unit and our comms and our fleet unit, and we do have um, resources that we can bring to the table. We have mobile command posts that can be um, offered up. We have um, a satellite trailer that can come in and do communications. We now have a field hospital, uh, which we didn't have, four years ago, three years ago, um, but after COVID, uh, the federal government dropped off the field hospital and said, oh, by the way, this is yours for good. So now we have a field unit, which includes all the piping and draping for the um, you know, separation of the beds. We have all the beds, the medical beds, et cetera. So we, uh, we now have a warehouse, which we did not have pre-COVID. Um, we have a lot of PPE, if anybody needs PPE. So um, that was a new charge for us with COVID handling all the PPE requests across across the state. Um, we have um, message boards, light towers, things like that that we support the communities with. Um, we do have a comms person, um, a comm L and a comm T, which is an acronym for different um, kind of capabilities of communications person. They work a lot with state police and the radio system um, across the state. Recovery and mitigation, I, I won't uh, bore you too much, recovery, um, really is that public assistance uh, process. How many here um, have to do the public assistance with the reporting? Is it poor? It's just poor Kim. Um, it's very, very detailed um, down to who was the name of the individual that drove this type of truck and what is the cost of the, the hourly price of driving that truck. It's very, very detailed. So kudos to Kim. But um, that unit supports the locals in filling out that paperwork and getting that reimbursed, and then obviously we have mitigation, um, which there's more grants, et cetera, behind that, so I'm not going to bore you too much with that. Um, and then the rest of it's kind of kind of standard. Um, and we do have legal counsel, which is great. Um, we've tapped into them several times with different issues throughout the years. We have our own lawyer we can go to and ask um, uh, assistance for, which is great. So this is where we're located. Um, our office is in Franklin. Um, and we have four regions, and then headquarters again is out of um, our Framingham office. Um, so it's actually um, out of that um, Civil Defense Act in 1950, it actually mandated that each town have an emergency management director, and it mandates that there's an emergency management program. It actually says civil defense functions because of that old language, um, but that's why each town can't even do regional EMDs. Um, they all have to be localized. So obviously here it's your fire chief. In a lot of cases it's the fire chief. 
fire chief, but each town must have one. Um, we don't work in county government. Um, you know, if you go down south, they have county emergency management. Um, obviously, the Cape has a little bit more of a structure than elsewhere, but really for um, the entire state, there's no county government, which then makes our job much more interesting that we're now working with 351 communities rather than 14 counties, which is typically how it's done across the country. So it's very unique here. Um, just a breakdown of, of our EMDs. You know, again, most of them are fire chiefs. Uh, some of them are part-time EMDs and police and then a few town managers. Um, so day to day, we, we um, watch um, Web EOC. How many have heard of Web EOC? Yeah, a few folks. So it's our um, online platform we do for situational awareness and resource requests. So we're always monitoring that. Um, for COVID, that was um, quite a success for us to use that to track resource requests. Typically, in an event, we might have 10 resource requests. With COVID, we had over 6,000. So we use that. And even um, the, I call it snow apocalypse in 2015, even that, we only had 500 requests. So COVID really worked the system and, and showed that it worked and it didn't crash, which was great. Uh, and years past, Kim might remember, WebEOC used to crash all the time, so it stopped crashing, which is great. But that's how we track um, resources that are flowing and that's how communities can see what they're actually getting. Um, then we have the Health and Human um, Alert Network, which is um, a, an alert notification system that we use to do mass notification. Um, statewide mutual aid we're in charge of. Um, and then local coordinator, that's what I do. This is what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, but working with the communities to get them different grants. We're usually the pass-through for almost all of our grants. We'll get it from the feds, and then um, I'll work with the communities. They'll, they'll do the grants, and they'll, it'll be most of them are reimbursement type grant. Uh, local emergency planning committees, that's another big part of my job, uh, encouraging towns to have LEPCs. We'll go into the law a little bit behind that and why they're required. Um, but in most towns, they're required to have an LEPC um, and et cetera. Tabletop exercises, and I do local responses too. So obviously, the big one more recently here was the tornadoes in 2018. So I was down at the, uh, the MAC doing that. Um, so we actually have a dispatch center that runs 24-7. The number's really easy to remember. It's 508-820-2000. But if you get stuck in an elevator, and you look on the sticker on the elevator and you call that number, that actually calls us. So we will rescue you. Not me, <laughs> but uh, somebody will go and they will rescue you. Um, we also um, do, actually now, we just isn't even on here yet, it's kind of new. We do the um, hazmat uh, team dispatch. That's new, that just got released to us. Um, we are the point of contact for any earthquakes from the Weston Observatory. Um, and then the hotline for DEP too. So when you call a particular number, it'll come to our dispatch and then we have multiple dispatchers that have procedures and stuff that they'll follow and, and get it to the right person. And same for DCR, Department of Conservation and Recreation. So large scale disasters, this is really where people think of us and what we do. A lot of times people will say to me, well, what do you do on a normal day? So that's everything we do on a normal day. And then on a gray sky day, as we call it, um, we'll stand up our state emergency operations center, and that's where we'll have all of our partners come in um, and assist us with responding to it. Um, so our two big things I mentioned are situational awareness, so finding out what's going on around the Commonwealth, and then resource requests. Um, and we'll talk about how we, how we fill resource requests. Um, again, we serve as the central point of coordination for that response. Um, we, we activate multiple, multiple times a year. Um, it's not just for blizzards, but it's also for planned events. So obviously um, the marathon is a big one. We'll have over 250 people in our bunker, uh, including an FBI and some of those federal agencies will come um, and, and, and be there in case there's an event that happens. Um, and we are in direct communication. We're the point of contact with the governor if they're, uh, and his staff and trying to figure out what's going on with the response. So um, for those who are not familiar with emergency management, we have what we call ESFs, which are emergency support functions. This is how we organize ourselves when we activate. So we will stand up particular ESFs depending on the event. And each ESF um, has multiple partners that's responsible for, for bearing that responsibility in the ESF. 
most cases it is a state agency, so obviously transportation would be DOT. So if we think we need DOT, we'll ask them to come to the bunker and they send a representative. Um, we have 17 here in Massachusetts. Federally they have 15, but we did add cybersecurity uh, a few years ago. Military support, that's our uh, friends at the National Guard. Um, ESF-6, Mass Care, that's the shelter one. That's a big one that's almost always activated. Um, we have Department of Public Works, they're a big partner of ours too with the blizzards and the outages. Um, we normally will have representatives from Comcast, Verizon, The Grid, um, and Eversource. So they'll all come and provide representation. And even in big events, we'll have private vendors. So with 2015, we contracted with um, I think Ashbrook and Northern Tree. They'll even send representatives on site so we have direct communication with them about their equipment. I talked about Executive Order 144. Um, but again, as part of that ESF team, we have over 70 agencies um, that are a part of that, and it, oh, it's over 300 people. Um, and it also includes nonprofits, so Red Cross, Salvation Army, um, Su Chi is a, is a Buddhist agency we've recently been working with. Um, they've been great when we have to open up recovery centers. They actually bring a checkbook and give people money. Um, so they're a great new partner of ours um, that will come. Then we have our um, state and local response structure and how we, um, really this is just how things flow. So obviously something happens locally, you set up your incident command post, the chief um, would recognize that he needs resources, he'll put it through the EOC. Um, in this case, you go to the MAC, which is the, um, your, your county structure, and then if the MAC can't fill it, it will come up to the state. And then um, it's the state's job to try to figure out what's the best resource to fill that need. And so a lot of times, uh, let me see, which one's a better photo? Eh, it's kind of a busy photo, isn't it? Um, when it gets to the state EOC, we'll look at um, fulfilling it with our state partners, sometimes with private vendors. And then in um, rare cases, like in 2015, we'll actually activate other states. Um, they'll put in bids, we'll pick the states that we want to pick from, uh, probably the one that's that's cheapest and kind of the best best one, um, and we'll bring in those states and they'll support the response. So again, with 2015, we utilized Vermont National Guard, um, Pennsylvania came with an EOC team, um, so they'll all come to, uh, to help us out if that's needed. And then in rare circumstances, uh, FEMA typically doesn't <coughs> do response for smaller events. Uh, if we were to have a larger event like a hurricane, that they would be at the bunker with us, um, bringing their resources. Um, Hurricane Matthew a few years ago, when we were in the cone, FEMA actually activated um, heater mails all the way from Texas. They started driving up to come to Massachusetts, and then Hurricane Matthew took a turn, right, so they turned around and sent them back. But FEMA will activate things five days out, not knowing exactly where the hurricane's gonna hit. So they'll do that on occasion when it's, when it's really big. Um, but in the, EM world, we have a, a, a saying, uh, no go for snow, because in most cases, in, in blizzards, it's usually not reimbursable because it's just not enough snow. Like this last storm in January, um, to get to Clare, you have to have a particular amount of snow. You have to beat um, the threshold, the historical threshold. And Barnstable County was, I think, three or four inches too short. So unfortunately, in January, <coughs> this county did not get declared, but other counties did because they did have a historical record. So there's all these fun rules that you figure out <laughs> as you go along. Um, we talked about this resource coordination, so let's just go to the next one. All right, so activations. Um, I love graphs, I'm a little bit of a geek, I think, but um, this kind of just explains, it's a graphic on um, what type of events we're typically activating for. Um, so the good news is the highest one is exercise, so planned events that it's not an actual real response. Um, 56 for snowstorms, so that's no big surprise. We've activated the most for snowstorms. And then way behind that is planned events. And then we've got some flooding, severe weathers. Um, let's see, fire hazmat, plume, gas explosion. This was actually, well, no, that might include, uh, that probably include, includes the Merrimack Valley explosion, but there's been a few explosions actually throughout the years. Um, but we'll stand up and activate for those. 
Um, this is how many declarations we've had. Um, this is just a few years outdated, but in the past 10 years. Um, so the only event um, we have uh, what I call the public assistance uh, funding, which is when the town gets reimbursed. And then in more rare occasion, um, FEMA will come and declare individual assistance, which means they're actually writing checks to people. So when you think of Sandy, that's probably what you think of. The last time we had that in Massachusetts was actually 2011, no, it was 2010, it's on the bottom there. Um, that was um, flooding in April. Um, so you know, like 44 in Taunton, completely flooded out. Um, so that was $58 million in damage, um, and that was the total amount of assistance. Um, for, I mean, minus COVID, the next storm was actually 2015, where I talked about bringing in those other states. That was $84 million of a response um, that would be somewhat reimbursed from FEMA. But the individual assistance is much more rare, and the threshold is much more harder to get to that. So any questions? Um, I'm going a little faster than I thought I would. Any questions? No? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's what our state agency does. Um, how we integrate into LEPCs um, is a little bit more interesting. Um, are, are, are you familiar with the background behind LEPCs and why we have them? Or has it been a while and people don't? I'll just briefly go over it. So in 19, it all comes from 1986 when there was a massive um, hazmat spill and in response in India where um, thousands of people immediately died and then um, thousands of people were injured and you know continued years and years to come with different cancer rates, et cetera. So out of that response, um, America, um, the United States came up with EPCRA. Um, what an acronym we all love, but it stands for Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act of 1986. Um, and at the time, the president um, mandated, this law came into effect that mandated that each state come up with a, what we call a CERC, which is the State Emergency Response Commission. Um, and the governor in Massachusetts decided that MEMA would be this commission. And our, the MEMA director is actually the um, the CERC director, so we're in charge of um, over this commission. Um, and what we bring industry partners to the table, um, different towns, but we oversee um, LEPCs, REPCs, um, the tier two side of things. Um, so that's our role. Um, and part of this law, it actually dictates why you're all invited here. It's actually by, by law, certain things are required. Um, these are some of the, the local departments that need to be included, obviously police, fire, civil defense, um, and environmental professionals. Um, that's also why the media needs to be included when you have these meetings. This is actually all part of that law. Um, some of the requirements, again, by EPCRA law, you have to have your emergency response plan, which would be um, your hazmat plan, um, and you have to have a, permit, um, a mechanism that you provide information to citizens. It's called right to know because a citizen can come forward and say, this weird building is right next to my house. I want to know what's in it. I smell something every day. It's just funky. They can actually call the fire department and the fire department is to have um, a process where they give that information to the concerned citizen. Um, each committee must have a chairperson, you have rules and bylaws, and then again, establishing those procedures for requests for information from the public. Um, and just four other major provisions. A lot of the, the law actually is on the industry partner. It's on the, the facility. So the facility is actually, um, is really the responsibility of the facility to know that they're supposed to report their chemicals. So they have three places they need to report it to. They need to report it to the fire department, to your LEPC chair, and then to CERC, to MEMA. They have to send in three reports each year by March 1st, I think it is, it's March 1st, um, that they're required to send it to. So we have copies as well of all the hazardous materials um, in the Commonwealth. Um, so those last three items are really um, responsibility of the Tier 2 sites, so the hazardous material facilities, and then emergency planning is actually the responsibility that falls on this group, the LEPC. And I'm not gonna read this, but 
uh, it has about nine planning requirements that are to be a part of your emergency response plan. Um, and so what the CERC will do is um, we'll take a look at the plan and we'll provide feedback on your planning if it needs EPRA compliance. And so that's our role in it. Um, we used to have um, a certification process a few years ago. We got rid of that. Um, we're moving to a simple registration process where it'll just be a one pager and it'll say who's your coordinator, um, do you have a plan, and does it have these components. Um, so it's going to be a much simpler process, but um, the CERC is in charge of managing that process um, and providing support to the communities. Um, any questions on the CERC? Okay. No? All right. Um, that actually wraps up uh, my presentation, so I apologize, Chief. It was, I meant to go like 45 minutes, and it went a little quicker than I, than I thought it would. But that's really what our agency does. We're really here to support the locals in all phases of emergency management. Um, you know, just the other day, when you had an incident, um, the barricades, you know, I'll call the chief to check in and say, hey, do you need an alert sent out, we can do a wireless emergency alert. So we're here to support the town with different resources. Um, and if I don't have the resource, I usually know who to call to get it. Um, so it's really just a huge coordination piece. Um, but I, I just wanna again say Falmouth has been one of the strongest LEPCs I've seen in my 11 years. Um, so kudos to you guys to continue to work through it. I know it's sometimes not the funnest thing or the sexiest thing, but um, kudos to you guys for coming and, and being an active partner with the, with the town, so. So I'll leave it at that. Rachel, can you just expound a little bit on, on some of the other resources that you have, you know, front end loaders, all, all of that kind of stuff as well sure. that, that you have access to? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I don't have any photos, so I apologize about right. that. A lot of the resources that we'll bring are typically not our resources. So while we did just get a warehouse, if you had called us five years ago, we didn't have a warehouse. So when people call and ask for a generator, we do not have a warehouse full of generators. What we'll do is we'll tap into different partners that have those resources. One of the most common ones we use is the um, Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security each year gives funding to the state. Um, and down here, um, the fiduciary that controls that, they've actually bought equipment. And in um, Barnstable, the town of Barnstable, you have a cache site where it has generators, um, light towers, message boards, um, shelter equipment, et cetera. So a lot of times we'll call the community that own, that is holding that asset and ask that asset to get moved to support a community. Um, for heavy equipment is usually one of the bigger requests we get. We depend on um, DCR, um, DOT. Uh, for the tornado for the first year, we use the the Department of Corrections, they actually have heavy equipment. We utilize them and um, prisoners came down and actually helped with debris removal. Um, we'll bring in um, voluntary organizations like uh, Team Rubicon, if anyone's military here, it's usually vets uh, that will join this agency and they'll do muck outs and debris removal. Um, and then if it's needed, we'll call in contractors and MEMA will never send you a bill. So if we're calling in Ashbrook and Northern Tree, we're paying the bill for that, and they'll come to your community. Um, but we typically will only do that when you've exhausted all your resources and exhausted your vendors. So we always ask, have you called your vendors? And if the answer is yes, then we'll start pulling some of those resources in. Um, it can take some time. So if you call me at 1 o'clock, it's not going to be there at 2 o'clock. It'll probably be there at 8 o'clock, hopefully the next morning. Um, so it does take, take some time to activate that. Um, and it's just a good point for expectation of management. If you call me for a snow plow for eight inches of snow, you know, DOT is, is plowing 495 and Route 28, and so they don't have extra snow plows. So usually for, for snow events, towns are usually on their own. They usually do a pretty good job. Um, in larger storms like 2015, you can start calling your resources. Um, but that's why we, we do encourage locals to be as prepared as they can be, and then we'll come in to step in when you need help. Yes? When, when there's a uh a power outage, you know, they have all these power companies from all over the world <laughs> coming. Yeah. Is, is that something you guys set up or is that something that, no. the, okay. That's a great question. No, yeah. Eversource and National Grid will handle all that mutual aid and bringing in the, um, 
their partners from, from, from elsewhere. Um, they'll usually sometimes give us a heads up of where they're staging. Usually Joint Base Cape Cod is a big area, but they're in charge of doing all that. They'll typically send a representative to the bunker, and then we have Department of Public Utilities that's always there. Um, his name's Brian, and he's great. And when we need to kind of, you know, address a particular issue, maybe a, a nursing home that's out, we'll work with DPU to help us get that back up and running so we don't have to evacuate, you know, 100 people, <laughs> something like that. So that, that partnership has worked um, really well. And we have a power map, if anyone's familiar with it. Um, the um, power companies are required to report their outages to us, and so it's this colored map where if you're black on the map, that's not good because it means you're 100% without power. If you're green on the map, that's good. It means you're only 5% without power, but it tells you the power outages across the state, and that's open now. You can just Google NEMA power outage map. It'll tell you there's 100 people without power, um, so that's always out there. But that's been a great resource. Yeah, Rachel, can you describe the the staffing on a daily basis and what their you know what a typical day is be and I only ask that because based on some of the events that are going on countrywide with you know with some you know a lot of these movements and things are, yeah. are they are they tuning into that so that if something was to become local that they're you know they they're not surprised they have a heads up. Yeah, so our, I mean, our staffing, so yeah. we're about an 80 person agency. Um, about 50 to 60 of those people are at the bunker and headquarters. And then about 20 of us are regional, meaning we're in the field coordinating. I mean, I was in Bourne today for a tabletop and then here this afternoon. So we're usually out in the field doing a lot of driving, meeting with the communities and just helping, you know, all four phases of emergency management. Um, what was the second part of that question? Like, what's the typical day at MEMA? Yeah, so right, it depends what department you you work in. So for me, um, a lot of it is um, doing different uh, grants with communities, um, sharing uh, public information. We talk about emergency preparedness. I'll do presentations for emergency preparedness, helping them with grants. Um, we encourage all our towns to have a local emergency management plan. So that's a big part of my job is doing that and reviewing those and providing feedback. Um, and then we'll kind of have different projects that we, we help on. Obviously, I do a lot of sheltering, so I'll work with communities on how to do regional shelter plans. Um, and then our operations, they're usually doing statewide exercises. Um, we do a lot of, um, we activate our command post a lot for planned events. So in two weeks, it's gonna be in Brookline for the um, golf tournament. So we'll support a lot of planned events um, and doing things like that, and then um, Obviously, recovery is extremely busy. We've brought in contractors to help with recovery for COVID because we have thousands of applicants that are seeking reimbursement. So they, they're pretty busy right now. And then on the mitigation side of things, um, if you have an approved mitigation plan that opens towns up to millions of dollars of funding, and so they're working with towns getting approved plans and helping them through those projects with FEMA. I, I love my job. Every day is a little different, which is nice. I don't, I don't have to sit in an office and stare at a wall. So, Rachel, can can you just talk a little bit about? Um, as you mentioned that NEMA stands up their EOC for planning events, right? right? So you're just kind of standing by, which it sounds like for you know for someone who's not aware. Yeah. But um, I had an opportunity to speak to Rich Latour yeah. about the what happened at the Boston Marathon and some of the things that NEMA had to do. A lot of you know the public is probably not aware of. They think mm. that a lot of that falls on the on the shoulders of the local and state police, um, mm. but essentially MEMA played a, a, a large role in what happened at that event. You mean in 2013? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, and because of 2013, we really have when we activate the EOC for uh, the Boston Marathon, it's almost 300 people um, because it's serving as the main central coordination for all decisions, um, even EMS. Um, we have an EMS division that will stand up and, and you know we're a part of all the planning efforts behind the Boston Marathon so we're working very closely with the Boston Athletic Association um, and there's a 100 200 page plan a plan for course disruption a plan for a terrorist attack a plan for severe weather 
Um, how are we communicating with all the volunteers on the course? How are we communicating with the runners if we need to turn off that, that race? Um, FBI, I mean, there's so many partners that day. Um, and then me, I, I'm actually in the field at one of the local um, EOCs. I'm usually in Natick. Uh, they are monitoring web EOC and watching what's going on as we have a suspicious package here and a suspicious person there. I'm telling the police chief, hey, this is, this is looking funny. You know, he wants to keep an eye on it. Um, actually, it was cool. Last year, I, um, Natick was a part of saving a woman's life. She hadn't had enough salt, and if anyone's a runner, if you don't have enough salt, you can literally die while you're running, and she, she was rescued on, on the ground there, so it was pretty cool being a part of that. But um, yeah, it's a lot of work behind it. We planned for that six months out, the Boston Marathon. Um, so it's been a big role. And then obviously the SWAT teams, the, 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 the teams that do the chemical um, radiation, you know, the seaborne teams, so it's a huge effort. So with the planned events, do you have to be notified on the local level to get to the state level? And, and I ask because we have two large events every year, the 4th of July, mm -hmm. and one of the few communities that's you know, rivals, you know, right after the, the Esteban, and then the road race. And we utilize the Department of Fire Services support ICS. Right. So they, they stand up and they come down here and they provide support. But it's your office, do we have to notify you or is it something that is discussed amongst the agencies? Yeah, that's a great point. Typically for July 4th, we will um, do some situational awareness on finding out how many towns are holding events. So we'll have a list of like 100 towns who are holding events. And that's more just for situational awareness. We will, um, for, the, for Boston, we do end up supporting with the command post. They actually, multiple communities ask for the command post. So we have two of them. So they're literally from like July 1st to the 5th. They're floating around to different towns as they ask for them. And they operate as a command center for fire police and dispatch centers. Uh, but we usually will have a good awareness of what's going on. And then folks higher level at NEMA are aware of any threats from the fusion center in Boston doesn't usually get down to my level, but you know, they're usually aware of that. So yeah, we actually have um, embedded within MEMA, we have two state troopers. So they, they're state troopers, but they actually come to our office every day and work with us every day. And that's worked out really well to be embedded with them too. So that's the only state agency that's with us every day, which is, which is nice. So we wouldn't have to formally notify you that the town of Falmouth is doing X, Y, and Z. Yeah, we well, have a little bit of awareness. Yeah, for those bigger events, um, you know, we're familiar with the 5K as well. Yeah. Um, and then the Fusion Center is tracking events and they rate them different tiers and we're notified when different public events are, are you know, of concern so that we'll get notified to our leadership. Okay. Yeah, and then we try to keep eyes on what's happening. So we heard about, you know, that issue that happened two weeks ago. So we'll, we'll do outreach to see what's going on. Um, and if resources are needed, and sometimes I'll come out on scene if it's needed. So the tornado was a good example. Um, went out on scene for that. Um, and then we have multiple people in what I do. So if we need to bring in additional folks, we can. And then we'll activate. We work with CERT teams. Um, you know, Brockton had a major water main break in 2015, and we actually brought in regional other CERT teams to support that. They set up four points of distributions, which is pretty a big deal for four water sites. Um, and they all, we all ran out of water within an hour. People came and grabbed the water, and then um, so we'll do responses like that. And we all worked those pod sites and brought in other CERT teams to help to help with that. So there's usually a few water pod sites a year. Somebody. <laughs> this one's so. Rachel? Yes. Is, we used to work in the EOC, and we have web EOC up and running during the storm. Obviously, there's back and forth with the yeah. communities. But, like, for July 4th events and stuff, is that something that we should? We yeah, if you'd like to, yeah. for, your own, for your own tracking purposes, and then our dispatch is constantly monitoring it. Are you Boyd, by the way? I am. Oh, it's great to meet you. Well, I always see Boyd on nope, WSC, no one, and I'm always like, No one ever says that. No one ever says that. We do that on purpose, Rachel. I've always wanted to meet you. Are you Boyd? Because you always do such a great job. I'm like, Fallon is the only one posting. This is great. Yeah. 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 Ye
great. And it's him. So that's great. That's great. But yeah, if you wanted to post, um, our dispatch is constantly monitoring it. And if anything were to go awry. Yeah. <laughs> it's just great to meet you. I can't yeah. believe after all these years, you're just fat for here out of the Yeah, yeah. Everybody He's a man boy. behind the curtain. Chris, do you know who I was <laughs> We still haven't figured it out. He's our enigma. Oh, <laughs> What's great? He's got great updates. It's like how I want the towns to operate is how you guys do it. We post your updates. I always know what's going on. I know this station's on generator. This road is flooded. It's usually the same places, right? But it's helpful. It's, it's really helpful. We've been cut and paste that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's station two. It's always down. There we go. So now I'm going to have to. I have to pick up my game. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna have to you can title change. Title change. Yeah, yeah, right. Rachel. Yeah, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, Rachel. <laughs> as far as training, do you foresee um, any new types of training coming up? Have they talked about anything else they're going to roll out? Or so we have. Um, FEMA had an independent study online um, for EOC operations, and FEMA made that one also in person. So that one, if you're interested, it's June 21st. That's off Cape, but then. Um, the Cape asked for that um, in the Orleans Brewster area for end of September. We'll be hosting that one there. Um, we have the we have quite a few trainings. We have one on access and functional needs. Um, obviously, 300 and 400. Um, we have a sheltering class that I typically do. Um, we have hazmat. Uh, I think it's awareness we do. Um, there's quite a few that will kind of pop up through the year. Public information. Officer is one. We have one that's like a, you know, ICS 101 for elected officials. Um, that one's pretty popular with them to, to get them to understand the ICS structure and what their role is in it in the response. Um, nothing too new, kind of the standard stuff. And FEMA continually is updating their classes too. Great. Yeah, I mean, the, the ongoing emails with um, you know, notifications about the upcoming training is, you know, we've taken advantage of it. Know Craig and I went to the to the interface oh, yes. uh, at Franklin, yeah. and, that had involved that, and that involved a couple of state troopers that were part of that, you know, all out, you know, of, right. of state planning, and that was very, very interesting. And then your recent one that you put on was very interesting as well, so. Yeah, yeah, and that we have a EMD orientation that really um, talks about what is an EMD's responsibility. That was a new one that we, that we created. Um, so every couple of years will be something new. And it's shifted throughout the years. We used to have a school safety one, and then that one doesn't exist anymore, so. And then we do have a public information officer, and myself included, will do community <coughs> education really by request only, that's not too uh, proactive, it's more reactive mm -hmm. with requests, but, um, you know, usually I'll come to the fair you guys have. It's been a few years, right? It's because of COVID. Pre-COVID, yeah. 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 So, yeah, it's an interesting job, but we, we are busy on Blue Sky Days, but. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Yep. Any other questions? I didn't put anyone to sleep. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Great questions. So we can drag it out. So, um, no, but I, I can't thank Rachel enough because, um, you know, she is engaging and um, she's always been available to answer questions for us, like I said, you know, during, mainly during our events, but she's made her assistance available to us uh, for you know programs like this and me and now I'm thinking maybe we should have her in for a training program <laughs> so uh, we'll think of something mm -hmm. um, because now that you bring up school safety that's I'm sure that's gonna come yeah. flying back up to the top of the, the list of things unfortunately um, but yes yeah, so, I mean so Rachel did you know comment the other day when we had that uh, event involving law enforcement and you know in the fire department's uh, role was you know was to support the the law enforcement agencies that were on scene as well as any casualties but that luckily was handled very professionally by the uh, local police department um, but you can imagine 
you know, not only are they, they dealing with a, a, a tragedy, but they had a, an armed suspect that they had at bay across the street from an elementary school. So not only did they have to take care of everything that was going on, the communications end of it was inundated, but they had to use, they, the local police had to count on the surrounding police departments and the state police to help evacuate the school. So it was a big undertaking, but in the middle of it, you know, Rachel, you know, reached out to me and, uh, you know, wanted to offer in case if we couldn't get any messaging out because dispatch is so busy, the state can step up and, and help us out. So it's, it's good. And I've also, at previous events, I've been notified through um, the Department of Fire Services through their special operations who we would notify through MEMA in some instances. They, they also say, hey, listen, we're, we're right here. We're ready to go. We, we'll get, be there in 35 minutes. And so we're very fortunate that, it, you know, in, in, in my opinion, that the, the Commonwealth is uh, highly regarded when it comes to the responses. Um, and even though things aren't happening on blue sky days, they can. So knowing that it's just a phone call away, and nobody's going to be surprised if we were to make a phone call, and we can start to get the ball rolling. And again, it, it may not happen immediately. We know that we can focus on the task at hand because the other things are all being taken care of. So that's that's really helpful for us, especially when we're trying to run things. You know, the LEPC, you know, is great foundation for us. When we do stand up the EOC, um, we have Boyd, so uh, the face of EOC. So uh, doing a lot of stuff in the background, the phone calls, the coordination with everybody. But in the two instances that I mentioned during the 4th of July in the road race, we stand up a mobile EOC, and because of the support by the Department of Fire Services, they have their, their incident support unit, which we work in and um, coordinate everything through a joint or a unified command structure. And they set up another um, vehicle, which is their rehab vehicle, which is, you know, the big, the big vehicles. Um, and that's our EOC. If something was to happen, we can step out of one vehicle and step into the other, and it's all ready to go. And we don't have to come back here and try and stand up everything. So, you know, pre-forecasted events, we can come in here and set this all up. We can have what we detail as a partial, um, you know, stand up or a or act of act activation or a full activation where we have all of our partners here. Usually, the just the partial activation does enough for us to, to coordinate a lot of stuff, and we really haven't gone into a big full mode. And I wouldn't really want to because that's a major event and that's going to be you know real significant but for the events that we have had it's it's a it's a good exercise for us even in real time to uh, test our activities out and we have been working at it and working at it and it's been a, each event is another stepping stone to you know to good you know response by us and when we had the storm and was it in October that we had which you know, we set that up in a half, less than a half hour. I, I, I woke the Craig and, you know, well, the deputy woke me up, but I was already up because I was listening to it, and then I woke these guys up, you know, yelled at Chris, <laughs> and, uh, and within less than, you know, in about a half hour, we had this whole room set up and we were on. And, we could, and that took the, um, some of the um, issues that were inundating the communication center away from them, and we started coordinating things here so they could answer some of the emergencies. So it's, it's that quick, and, and that um, the, other, the other part of it is that the commitment from the from personnel and, and Kim to put it all together and coordinating with MEMA on a, on a, on a fairly regular basis, um, even if it has to do with money. But you know, at least it's going on all the time. So it's it's not just the LEPC coming together on Thursdays. It's it's constant activity that's going on. So and you guys, you know, are um, are responsible for you know a lot of our successes. So I you know I, I can't thank you enough for for joining us on these Thursdays um, and participating. And and that being said, you know now we go into our summer recess. Um, we will be, you know, not meeting on, uh, on on a Thursday in June, July, and August. We'll be back on the 22nd of September. Um, if there is anything that comes about, I'm sure you'll read about it or hear from us. Um, 
but uh, we will, you know, we'll, we'll keep our, you know, line of communication open with Beamer and especially Rachel, and we can do a few things. But uh, you know, I, you know, my my oversight of the of, as an EMD and you know, and the EOC is is, is you know it, is made available through all of the resources that everybody provides in um, everybody's time and commitment. So. Um, you know, I, I think our particular community is very fortunate that we have all the individuals that are involved. So, um, and that includes all the different agencies, whether it's police, whether it's CERT, um, Human Services, the DPW, and so on and so forth. Phil, um, GIS, and uh, you know, and then you know, communications and the police and, and, and the such. So we're we're very fortunate that everybody takes it as serious as they do. So, so. Anybody has anything? You know, we're, we're more than happy to chat more. If not, I thank you for uh, coming out today, and again, thank you, Rachel, very much for taking the time and coming over the bridge. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just barely over the bridge. Yeah, that's and it. And I got to go to my favorite bakery. So oh, okay. God. Which <laughs> one's that? The, the one on Main Street. Oh, the French one. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes. French uh, one. <laughs> we'll do it. We, did you have some today over at the Is there any other? Did you make it downstairs? Is there any other? Yeah, right? Is oh, I, I didn't make it upstairs. Man, that, that's that's killer. <laughs> I'm like, I stay away from it. All I can smell is butter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, well, good. I'm glad you did that. So, so, and also, thank you, Jeff and FCTV, for uh, making this possible for those that can't join us and to record it. We appreciate it. And, uh, and also helping us during storms and other, um, you know, events and or getting notification out. So thank you very much. So, all right. Well, thank you all and have a good day. Enjoy the <laughs> holiday weekend. Be safe and uh, yes. see you in September. Rachel will be checking. <laughs>